Then all of a sudden the sound started. I was like, oh, darn it. OK, so uh, today we are here to talk about cemetery preservation. Uh, and as Nick said, my name is Chris McKay. Um, I want to be very clear, though. Today's discussion is about preservation aspects, not restoration or conservation, uh, because restoration does require a different set of skills. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about how to fix broken tombstones. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how specifically to identify the materials and then what tools I use and then the methods that are used to clean tombstones. So this stone right here is the stone that I used to see every single time I drove from Douglasville to Marietta. Don't worry, I live much closer now. But for many, many years on my way here, I would pass the Marietta City Cemetery and this stone, I could see through the fence in my car waiting for the light to change. Uh, and this is Alice V. Mosley. And this stone just always caught my attention. And that's really what spurred my interest in learning about the history of Marietta City Cemetery. The short version of her life, which I have obviously in much more detail, uh, she obviously was born in 1864. She was the last child of Hiram and Mary Mosley. Uh, her father actually had died a few months prior during the Civil War. She was raised by her mother with her older siblings um, and then stayed with her mother. She never married. Uh, when her mother passed away, she was living with uh, one of her older brothers. And the death date, which is February 12, 1933, her cause of death was actually due to burns that she sustained when she got too close to the fire and her clothes had caught and she was unable to uh, get them out fast enough. So it's very interesting the stories we find and again I didn't know that when I first saw the stone but obviously she was wanting me to tell her story and now I get to tell many many others. If you have not been to the Marietta City Cemetery this is the Bench uh, right out of the main entrance on um, West Atlanta. So that is the only entrance now. There used to be another entrance off of Powder Spring Street. That entrance is now closed. You cannot enter or exit from that location. Um, and this actually did get a nice clean about almost a year ago in October. Uh, it got a nice clean. So it's very bright and pretty and shiny. This represents all of my people in the city cemetery. Actually, it's not all of them, but it's the majority. So if you're familiar with the Marietta City Cemetery, it can be very confusing. It is one very large cemetery that's actually broken up into three parts. The first part, which is the area closest at the top with no red dots, is the Confederate Cemetery. That is state property. I do not work in that cemetery. I am a city employee, not a state employee. The second area in the middle is our older section. So the 1830s is when it started, and it has much more of a park-like, meandering kind of feel to it, a lot more trees. Um, and then what we have in the bottom portion is the newer section that was developed in the early part of the 20th century because the old section was getting full. But if you walk around, you're probably say, mm, that doesn't seem right. We do have this one kind of gap area here, and that is because that area slopes, and then it ends out into a really boggy patch. So the boggy area does not support any burials. But the sloping area would have been where our potter's field is, so you don't see any markers. It's where those who did not have enough money to buy a plot were buried. Um, we have not done any sort of GPR in there to see how many people are there, but I am starting to build a record of names of people who, uh, on their death certificate, it says buried in city cemetery, but we don't actually have a known marker. All of the red dots indicate markers that if you went onto the city's website, our GS GIS department put together, so if you clicked on a dot, it would show you the name, and ideally it would show you a tombstone. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. We're working on that. Uh, but my next goal is to identify all the veteran markers, and we're going to turn those dots blue so that you can find the, the veterans a little bit easier. But this does not represent every single burial. 
Uh, there are some that are not, uh, they just haven't been mapped yet, but it is also plotted out. And then later when we're done, you're more than welcome to look at this framed um, image from 1990, which was a survey done, and it gives a little bit more of an idea of what it looked like in 1990, who had plots in the newer section, and then the older section, it's more of like little triangles to represent coffins. Um, so I didn't do that one, but I think it's pretty interesting. So I wanted to show first, start first with something that like, happened yesterday. I kind of had an idea. and. Yesterday morning, uh, I went out to the cemetery, and I wanted to find, see if I could find some people. That may sound strange, but I, let me tell you why. This right here is a ground probe, okay? They use it to find septic tanks, all this kind of stuff. So this is my ground probe. Nothing very fancy. It does its job. And you can see my ground probe is standing right next to, it says DS Wall Raven, but there's no other tombstones in that plot. But I know there's four, maybe five people buried there. So that is the probe just sticking in the ground. Nothing's happened. But yesterday, I was able to find that is the location of one, either vault or stone that I hit. That is the location of a second one that I hit. That is the location of a third that I hit. So I hit three either vaults or potentially tombstones. Uh, so we will have to go back another time, try and excavate a little bit to see what is actually there. If it is a tombstone, we will try and dig it out and place it back. If it is a vault, we'll just obviously mark it, but not, um, we'll just leave the ground and the grass where it is. But these, that's what my ground probe will do when it hits something. What will happen if my ground probe doesn't hit something, but it looks like the soil has been disturbed, and this is gonna be a little bit harder to see. This is obviously the top. That angle shows my, ground probe has actually gone all the way down as far as it can go, showing a void in the ground. So that void is telling me that there's potentially somebody that has been buried there because when you uh, dig up dirt and then you put it back, it's never the same way it was. Um, and then there's also in that location a slight depression. So if you're ever in a cemetery and you start walking around and you start feeling a little bit of depressions, that's a good time to get your probe out and see. I could also take the probe and spin it. Um, so that's telling me that there's probably somebody there. Do I know who? No. Did somebody say, ouch? No. <laughs> so I'm just, you know, I'm just telling you that um, there's probably more people buried there at the city cemetery than we actually have tombstones for. So. Uh, that was a great day. I actually had to send a video to somebody and share it with them. Um, so I wanted to share for the preservation part what stones or styles you're going to see in the southeast specifically. Um, you might see limestone, sandstone, things like that in the northeast. I'm not there, so I'm not going to talk about those. Specifically for us, marble and granite. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about bronze and white bronze. But what I want you to realize when I show you these pictures, you guys are seeing the afters. I'm going to show you the befores later, just because it makes more sense when I show you these, uh, the difference. So this is marble. Uh, the first stone you're seeing is a white marble. The streak in it is from the birds. Because when you clean a stone and it's bright white, the birds think it makes great target practice, and they poop all over them. Uh, it happens all the time. But white, pure white marble is going to be much more expensive than the marble next to it, which is that striation, very a uh, lot of different color marble. We're in Georgia. Tate marble, it's, Tate is just up the road. Marble was very easily accessible around here. So that's why we see a lot of marble, especially in the older cemeteries like ours, uh, which started, it says 1831, but I really think it's a couple years later. 
Um, but this is actually the first stone um, I cleaned. And this, was, uh, this picture is actually from about two weeks ago. And then the second stone I had cleaned um, in March. But I'll show you guys a little bit later that um, the before picture. Now the other type of marble I wanted to show you is military marble. Now there's no difference. A lot of the military markers, they got their marble either from Tate or some of them, uh, the marble actually comes from Vermont. So you'll see different styles in military stones. So this first one here is um, an upright with a shield. You'll only see that shield symbol for Union veterans and then Spam War veterans. Do you know what Spam War is? Spanish American. <laughs> it, says, it says right here, S-P-A-M War. So I call them my Spam War. Um, we have a couple of Spanish American War veterans in the city cemetery. But um, so that's the style you'll see for Union and Spanish American War uh, is the shield. And then after uh, World War I, you'll see a style that looks similar to the flat one. You could either see it in the flat style or upright, but really in private cemeteries, either private or municipal ones, the government really wanted you to have more of a flat one versus one that's standing upright because the upright ones really were supposed to be reserved for the national cemeteries. But um, both of those are marble. And the great thing about these is the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs kept really good track of when families would order the stones. So while Mr. Wilson here died in January of 1921, I know that stone wasn't put in until later uh, because the records are available to see and see when the family um, had it installed. So that's, that's one thing I love about military records. Some of times they do a really good job uh, of getting, getting the information you need. And then the flat one right there, um, that one was actually cleaned September and actually September 11th by a group of uh, non-commissioned servicemen who, and women who were here at Dobbins. They helped me clean a bunch of veteran stones. And then this one was cleaned in May. Um, so granite, granite we start to see here in the 20th century a little bit later because again marble is just so prevalent. Um, but that's not to say that you might not have a couple of stones that have granite a little bit before the 1900s, but it would be the latter part. Uh, so you have two styles, really. You have polished and unpolished. Now, both of these contain a mix. The vast majority of this one is polished, except for where the names are and then the bottom. And then Mr. Stewart's, the edges of his are polished, whereas the rest in the middle is unpolished. And again, if you put your hand over it, you'll feel the difference. Um, and also, when you clean it, polished is way better to clean than unpolished. The water and everything just comes right off. It's great. Um, but you'll also see more uh, variations in colors. Um, and it's a little bit more of a sturdy stone. So it can take a little bit more of a, a brushing than marble can since marble is softer. Now, bronze, bronze is very interesting. And I'm actually going to tell you right now the method with bronze on how to clean it because I'm not going to come back to it. Bronze actually uses a product called, this is Orvis paste. This is actually a textile paste. We actually use this here in the museum. Very gentle. It's a mild uh, detergent. But what Orvis paste does not do is it doesn't keep cleaning over time. So the reason we use Orvis paste on bronze is a product, which I'll show you in just a minute, this D2, which does clean over time, is not made for bronze. It's made for stone. It's a, it's a biologic. Whereas Orvis paste, it will clean the, uh, the bronze, and it, will it shine it up? No, but it will kind of get off any growth or anything that you have on it. Now this one right here that has that bluish patina, that's not gonna come off. That is the way the bronze has oxidized over time. And what you will see, though, is a ch um, stone, or excuse me, I keep saying stones, but bronze that was put in before 1973 has a different uh, makeup than bronze that comes in after 1973. So that's why we see two different looks. 
Um, this one in particular, they actually still have, in the middle, that is a flower base. So if you go and grab it and pull it and turn it, you can put flowers in it. Um, my coworkers yesterday were like, what? And I go, twist, you pull it out and you turn it upside down, put flowers. They're like, seriously? And I go, yeah, that's how this works. Um, but again, they, uh, the second one, it does have a little bit of some oxidiza oxidization on it, but we could clean that up a little bit and get it to look a little bit better. There are some other methods that can be done to shine it up, but um, for me, they're still legible, they're still readable, so I'm not going to do anything like that. The other thing that we have, and I have yet to find another one in Cobb County, but I'm not done going through all the cemeteries yet, is white bronze. So the Marietta City Cemetery has one. This is the grave of A.J. Hansel. This white bronze, as it was marketed as, um, is actually zinc. And you might hear it referred to as a zinky. If you go up to it and knock on it, it's hollow, it's made of metal. Um, and this one would have had panels uh, on all four sides that have been broken off because those panels, uh, when they are constantly uh, exposed to fluctuations in temperature, will start to separate from the rest of the stone and they're very easy to break. Um, the whole thing is cast. It was made by a company called the Monumental Bronze Company out of Connecticut. They were the only manufacturers of these types of monuments. They then sold them to subsidiaries who would then, you know, find, they would sell them to the families. This one is from 1881 when he died. I have found this exact uh, model in their 1882 catalog. It sold for $120 in 1882. In today's money, that's $3,500. And my coworkers and I said yesterday, that's not bad. $3,500 for that, that monument, that's pretty good. Um, but the base of it, uh, the actual base is on stone. And the other thing that you could tell with uh, these white bronze ones, they have this bluish gray tint to it. So if you're ever out of the Marietta City Cemetery and you start to walk around and you see one that just looks a little off from the rest of them, it's because it's a white bronze or a zinky. Um, we have had times where people have put uh, candles in there, <laughs> lit a candle. Don't ask me why, but that's just what they've done. Um, but yeah, so that is our only one. And as I said, I have not come across another one in the county. If I do, everybody will know, but I haven't come across it yet. So let's talk a little bit more about the cleaning, the actual aspects of, of cleaning. So first things first, you have to ask permission. Even though I am a city employee and it is the Marietta Sea Cemetery, I did ask other people first if it was okay. Um, and I did get, and it was fine. They were fine with it. They actually come out with me sometimes and clean too. Secondly, and this is, a, this is something that I apply to the museum as well. My job is collections manager in here and I deem the tombstones out there a collection as well. So first, do no harm. If I feel uncomfortable, I will not clean a stone. I'll just move on to the next one. I've only got 4,000 plus. So those are the two biggest things. Now with asking permission, I say next to it, unless it's your family. You don't have to ask permission. That is your family and you have every right to clean your family's stones. So none of my family live here, so I can't clean any of them, so I've adopted other people. Um, but again, when you're there, take a look, assess the stone, go up to it, look at it, go all the way around, see if there's any cracks, put your hands, on, now if it's flat, you're not going to have this issue, but if it's upright, put your hands on it and give it a little wiggle. If it starts to wobble, walk away. If it doesn't, if it's secure, great. If you see a crack in it, and you're really not comfortable cleaning it, I'll discuss a method that you can use that would require very little touching and it'll be, it'll be fine. Take 
a before picture. Please take a before picture because I have made the mistake of not. And if you're familiar with uh, something, the website Find a Grave, sometimes you can be very lucky and somebody will have taken a picture. Uh, and you can use that as an example or as I showed you guys earlier, that map we have, our GIS department had taken pictures. So always take a before picture. My phone is loaded with before pictures. <laughs> uh, I try and load them off every single time. And then note any inscriptions or anything unusual that you might not have seen while you're in the process of cleaning. Um, for example, there have been a number of stones that I have cleaned where I noticed at the bottom a maker's mark. I actually came across one this morning because yes, I did clean tombstones this morning. Um, any chance I get, I will do it. But note any inscriptions, if you're able to start reading maybe um, the uh, passages that are put on there, video yourself. I know it's, uh, you don't have to video your face, but just video the stone and you reading it, um, just so you can kind of get an idea of what, what is on there. Because oftentimes, places will have the name, the dates, but not necessarily the, the inscription. And that's really important because family took time to put something on that stone or to have something particular. So note all of that kind of stuff. So asking permission. I actually have the privilege of cleaning Marietta City Cemetery and Dawson Cemetery, which is located right next to my neighborhood. So it's very convenient. Um, Dawson Cemetery is located on Shalliford Road near Nicholson and McCleskey Ele uh, Elementary and Middle Schools. Um, this is the uh, entrance that used to exist until somebody hit it with a car and it uh, was taken down. But Dawson Cemetery is one of the largest uh, family cemeteries in the county. It's got about 225 people, including the Dawsons, including um, Dobbs, Brumbies, uh, Whites, Pecks, Bryans, there's many names. Um, and I have gotten permission to clean there. And this is a view from the back corner of what this cemetery looks like. They were kind enough to put everybody in rows, so I can just work my way row by row. Uh, they were kind enough to have a lot of polished granite, which is great. Um, but, and I'm gonna show you in just a little bit. The problem with this cemetery is, is it's all out in the open. So I'm very exposed to the sun and everything like that. Um, but since it's located right next to the bus lanes of the elementary school, uh, it has caused the stones to get a lot of different uh, agents of soiling, which we're gonna talk about right now. So let's talk about conditions, okay? Today, oh, today was a great day. This morning it was nice. It was cool. Tomorrow's going to be the same. Today is perfect weather to clean. Ideally, I like to go in the morning because, using Dawson as an example, as the day gets on and it gets warmer and warmer, those stones get hotter and hotter. And the water I'm bringing is cooler than the stones. So we don't want to put colder water on the stones. It's going to cause them to crack. It also causes the heat to radiate off onto you and you to start sweating and feel like you're melting. That may or may not have happened last week. So temperature is very important. Uh, we are very lucky in Georgia that we have a pretty long window that we can clean. And actually for us, the worst time to clean is like right about now, the middle of summer in January, February-ish. But the rest of the time we're very lucky. The Northeast, you know, they lose like six months out of the year, but we're very lucky. We want the temperature to stay above 40 degrees for at least 24 hours after we've cleaned, or actually before and after. We want to have a nice uh, long gap there. We want to make sure that everything in that stone is not going to freeze up and then kind of cause cracks. Rain, rain is great before you start cleaning. Having a really wet, rained on stone is great. Having a stone that gets wet after you clean it is not good. D2 requires 12 hours 
to sit. So if it rains within 12 hours, you're going to have to go back and reapply much sooner than you thought. Granted, if it's like 11 hours, I think you'll be okay. Wind, wind is mainly an issue for application. Um, so this bottle right here is not normally how I put D2 on a stone. I actually have a, a sprayer, like a garden sprayer that I use. If you use a bottle like this and it's really windy, it pretty much just goes out into the world and not onto the stone. So I recommend, um, if it's a really windy day, just either putting it into a sprayer where you can really get up close or uh, just waiting till it's not so windy. So our soiling agents, as you can see here, dirt, biological growth, which would include lichen, algae, moss, bird droppings, oh, my least favorite, uh, plant and tree sap. So any stones that are under trees or plants are going to get dirty faster. It's just how it's going to be. Uh, the freeze-thaw cycle can also cause issues and, and, um, within the stone. Improper cleaning, which I'll talk about that towards the end. Air pollution, bus pollution, which right now let me show you what a bus pollution kind of looks like. So these are all different um, air soil deterioration you've got or agents. Lichen, more lichen, bus. It's black, it's thick, it's tar-like, it's annoying, oh my gosh. That is a child stone, by the way, at Dawson. And then the last one is green algae. I love the green algae. That stuff comes off really, really quick. But the black, that, that black stuff is super, super thick and gross. Um, we have actually done a, uh, uh, no, History Loves Company. There we go. Couldn't remember the name of that. If you guys haven't seen those, we're doing some tombstone tourism ones. The last one was at Dawson, and we talked about how those stones are very, very dark um, with all that black gunk, and I really think it's from the buses, which are behind the line of trees in that picture. Um, and it's every day, so it's, uh, that's okay. I'm working on it. They're looking better. They're getting there. But those are your different types that you're going to see. Um, and they're all, I mean, you get all colors of the rainbow with the algae. So have, have any of them bothered me? No. Do any of them stain my clothes? I have not had that issue, but my coworker has, and I told her she wasn't doing it right then. No. I was like, you can't, got to wash your clothes when you leave, man. All right. So I have on this table, and afterwards, you guys are more than welcome to come and look and touch and feel all of it. You do not, and you're not required to have an Easter bucket with a chick. I also have a Tinkerbell one at home too, but a bucket for water for your brushes. I mean, how many of these do we have sitting around from the beach or from whatever? You might as well use this one. That's for water just for my brushes. I don't have my garden sprayer, but I actually use the two gallon ones. I think the two gallon ones work better just because uh, when I say clean potable water, I mean lots of it. I went through four gallons this morning on five tombstones. So it's a lot of water. I actually have old cat litter containers with really good handles that I use. And if you didn't know, cat litter containers are two gallons each. So it makes my life a lot easier. Various styles of brushes. I have a toothbrush. Those are great for the little spots. This brush actually had bristles that came out, but I have used it so much it's starting to wear. So this is another natural bristle brush. Um, if you'd like to go out to eat at Asian restaurants, please keep your chopsticks and use them. I'm serious. This is my coworker will do this, but we'll keep the chopsticks and it's good to get inside the, the grooves and anything like that. Bamboo skewers, also very good for the really thin spots. Plastic scrapers. Now, I do actually play favorites with my plastic scrapers. I like these a little bit better. They're a little bit tougher. These kind of have a little bit more of a bend to them, but they'll still work. The next three brushes, I well, actually, there's four of them. 
The next four, did I buy at the Dollar Tree? Yes, because when you keep buying brushes, it gets expensive. But all of these will work. This one you can actually see, see is starting to wear down too because I've been using it so much. This is another fave. This one right here, I actually keep dry and I use to sweep off any grass clippings or whatever first so that I'm not getting grass clippings in the, um, on the wet stone. Okay, let's see if this one will do it like yesterday because yesterday I went like this and a big puff of like dust came out of it. Uh, but I don't think, I think we got it all out. So this one is another natural bristle brush. This is a Tampico style uh, or brush. And I'm starting to love these more and more because it has a little bit farther of a reach. Um, and also it just makes me feel like a giant with a giant toothbrush and I'm brushing the tombstone. Um, so yeah, so these are the just, so when you guys come up you can feel them, the kind of brushes that I use. Um, and I'll talk about the ones not to use in just a little bit. But when it came to the actual cleaning product, again, as I talked about Orvis paste, I actually put a little bit of this into a spray bottle and mix it with water, and that's how you apply it to the bronze or the white bronze. D2, this is, again, this bottle actually has D2 in it. This is empty because I go through these really quick. Um, so this is a gallon. You can ask me what's in it, but I can't tell you because it's not actually on the bottles. Uh, but it is what is used by the National Park Service, the Veterans Affairs, uh, Department of Veteran Affairs, and it has been tested numerous times. So this is what one gallon, and then this is a quart bottle. Um, it has a very lovely kind of, somebody said to me it smells like citrus, but I don't know if I get a citrusy smell when I smell it. It's kind of refreshing and I'm used to it by now. Uh, but does it, here's the important part, does it stain your clothes? No. Does it ruin your nails? No. Does it do anything to hurt the grass or anything around it? No. That's why it's become the favored. Is it cheap? Not really. So that's why I'm going to show you some other ways without having to use this. It, this is about $20 a bottle, but it can last you quite a while. I'm actually... Uh, it, in Dawson, I have two of these, so two gallons. I haven't finished the first gallon, and I've done about 20 stones with uh, one gallon. And actually, I'll probably be able to get maybe five more in. Again, it depends on the stone, depends on how big it is, and how much um, growth it has on it. So there's kind of a few methods to cleaning. Method one is just water and scrubbing. That's it. Very easy. Uh, the second is water D2 and scrubbing, and the last is D2 only. So let me show you what water and scrub looks like. This is Mother. I forgot Mother's name. It's on the other side. Uh, but this is last year, actually on Mother's Day, while I made my children sit behind me and watch me clean a stone. Um, that was my present to me. Um, but this is uh, the stone with lichen and all of its biological growth on it. So I used water, I scrubbed, and then after that was done, I got this result. You can read everything, and it's got a huge inscription on the other side too. But I decided then, I don't need to spray this with D2. This looks good. I can read this, I'm happy. So I didn't, I didn't spray with D2. But what that has then led to is now, we're starting to see some of the growth come back since I'm not applying anything that's going to continuously, continuously work. Now, do I think it's awful and that I need to come back and spray it with D2? No. Is it, but I might go back with some water and just give it a little scrub. But that's what a water-only method looks like, and you can actually do, see a lot with just doing water. Um, because again, as I mentioned, this is not cheap, so if you have a stone that looks good after just doing water, and a scrub, but save this for something else that needs it and that needs something to work over time. All right, so this stone right here, I had actually shown the backside earlier with all the algae on it and stuff. So this is marble. Um, this is pre-Civil War. It's pretty hard to read. I gave it a good, a little, 
put water on it, gave it a scrub, still didn't look good, so I put D2 on it. And this happened. It's okay. We can all breathe. D2 is actually a clear liquid, but when it starts to react or interact with the biological growth, it will go orange or blush. And actually, the better, the brighter the blush, the blush, the better it is, because that's then telling me D2 has found those evil things and is gonna help me clean it off and get it better. So this is the blush, it's all right, because um, for some people, that can be very, very scary, and it, it, I understand. But then this is what ends up happening after you clean it. Now, what D2 is not going to do is get rid of any red rust color from the iron oxide within our Georgia clay, because that is not a biological growth. That's an actual stain. So that method is a little bit more intensive, and we have not done that yet. Uh, to get rid of that red dirt uh, spotting. But with this stone in particular, after the first cleaning, uh, I was able to see way at the bottom there is a maker's mark, and that stone was actually made in Cartersville. It's way down at the bottom. It's advertising. Did you know that they did advertising on tombstones? Smart. So if you have a blush stone, it's okay. So let's go back to this first one. First one, this is uh, Charlotte Coquine. This is the first stone I ever cleaned in February of 2021, okay? So this is two weeks ago. Looks good except for that bird dropping. That's what it looked like in February of 2021, okay? So we did, I did a scrub with water, D2, scrubbed it again. And then I actually did another application of D2 uh, this spring, so after a year, because it just wasn't bright enough. I wanted it, it still had a little bit of growth, so I did one more, and that's where we're at right now. And I will leave it like that. I'm not going to touch that one. And if you're in the Marietta City Cemetery, that one is located right across from the Sexton's house, which is the little white house right in the center. So it's, it's got its nice little spot, and it looks really good. So this one you saw earlier as well with all the striations. Um, it actually has uh, an inscription here. We're still trying to read that one, but again, with the way the marble is and the coloring, it's been very hard to read it. But that's what it looked like before. Um, I actually, that's before with some D2 on it at the bottom. That's why you kind of see the orange. But the other thing is when you take notes with a stone, you can then go back and compare the information. So this gentleman, um, Reverend Elijah Shepard, was actually uh, born in, in, into slavery and then after became a reverend. But what we do know is that his last name is actually spelled wrong. Not uncommon. And it's very hard to go back and get a new stone because this would have been expensive. This is, it's a sizable stone, but it, it should actually be S-H-E-P-A-R-D. Not even close, really. So, uh, and then there's stones where the date is wrong. For example, one stone had a woman dying 10 years before she actually did, which that's kind of scary. And then one the, in a different cemetery that I have never cleaned, but I visited, um, the woman died on November 31st. <laughs> so we're not sure if she died October 31st or November 30th, and they got it wrong. I'm not really sure. Uh, or December 31st, that's possible. So here is our military marker. So this was actually a couple weeks ago, and I cleaned it in May. That's what it looked like in May. So you're seeing it's still, it's not bright white. It's probably going to need another application of D2 down the road, but I won't do that till at the earliest, the fall, or maybe next May. Uh, I'm going to give it a chance to uh, see where it's going to go. And then this one right here, which was done, or which was two weeks ago and was done last September, that's what it looked like last September. So it's much better. Now, I want to show you one more, because again, you saw the one with the blush. 
And I'm pretty sure somebody thought last week when I was spraying a second application that I had done something really, really wrong because <laughs> there's a whole line of them, <laughs> all orange. There was somebody walking in the cemetery while I was spraying and they didn't ask me anything, but they sure looked at me weird. Um, but these four are actually um, under a tree, so they had to have a second application because of the tree sap and the berries and things that were falling off and the birds and all of that kind of stuff. So those got their second application and I'll go back and look at them in a couple of weeks. Now with our polished granite, it is my absolute favorite. Super easy to clean, doesn't take much time, but the bottom of this one, then this is the after, is still trying to come off because it is rough. It's a rough, unpolished granite. It's getting there. I looked at it this morning, it's looking better, but this is what it looked like before. So you could see the names look much cleaner and everything like that, much, much better. And then this is the unpolished one where the edges are polished but the center is not. Um, and this was just a few weeks ago and I, the before picture was in May. That was May. I actually just cleaned three more this morning that looked just like that. And when I was done, they're still drying. It's actually a light gray color like that. There were two others that I cleaned. And these are, these, this one's actually in Dawson Cemetery. There were two others that I cleaned that were gray when I started, but pink when I finished because they're supposed to be pink, not gray. Um, so you might see that too. So all of these methods that I've shown you with these pictures are including water, D2, and scrubbing. This one right here is D2 application only. Absolutely no scrubbing. I sprayed, I walked away, and I had to. Because this stone, and I'm, I'll show you some more close-up pictures later, down here at the bottom, when I touched it, it flaked off in my hand. So I had to stop, I said, I'm gonna spray this. I sprayed it, I walked away. This is the stone of Alston Green. This is pre-Civil War. If you've been to Green Meadows Preserve out in West Cobb, it's that family. Um, he died on the square in the 1850s when he turned to somebody and said something not very nice. And then the other guy pulled out a gun and shot him. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, which, but then the interesting part was the guy who shot him 25 years later died on the same day. I was like, that's very interesting. And it was one of those stories where, like, then legend had it that the little, his son was there and the son ran over and the dad said, take care of your mama boy and all that kind of, I, I don't know if it's true, but it could be. Um, but he is buried here with his, his parents are actually uh, just like a row up. But that's what that stone looked like before. You couldn't even read it. Absolutely illegible. Um, but again, I sprayed it with D2 and I walked away. So this stone I wanted to use here because let's talk about some of these don'ts. We don't want to use acid. We don't want to use anything like vinegar. We don't want to use bleach. Power or pressure washing, sandblasting, wire brushes, grinding tools. So I didn't mention this earlier. If you're not willing to take this and go like this on your skin, I wouldn't do it to a stone. So I'm going to take a wire brush and rub it on my skin like that. So if you're not, if, or if you're not willing to take that brush and scrub your car with it, then you're not gonna put it on a stone. So um, I'm gonna show you that stone again, Alston stone. Um, I believe that stone has actually had some bleach on it, just based off of these, um, the way it looks. So I know the first one's really hard to see, but there's various lines in it, and we can see that 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 marble is starting to literally split. It's almost gonna flake off in layers. Then you can see this crack running through it, and there's a closer uh, look of that one part that on the bottom that if you touch it, it starts to flake off. So a stone like that, again, I saw it, 
I did put my hand on it just to see if it was wobbly. It wasn't, so I just sprayed it and left it and let it be. Am I going to clean it again? Probably not. Am I going to apply anything else? No. It's, it's doing fine right now. Pressure washing, uh, I get this question a lot. Why don't we just pressure wash it? Pressure washing is the easy way out. But pressure washing is going to cause streaking. And if you could see this one right here, you could see how they've gone up and down, up and down, but the whole bottom they missed. So pressure washing is going to cause streaking, which we don't want to see, and it's just going to cause an uneven um, level of erosion on that stone. Um, so this one in particular is at Dawson Cemetery, and at one point, People thought that was the best method, and I understand it. I can't fault somebody for what they've done. I, I just gotta do what I can now. So no power pressure washing. And it does look good at, at first, but now looking at it, it doesn't look very good. Sandblasting is the other one. Um, okay, so the top picture is gonna look a little weird because I blended the name out because I'm not gonna call anybody out. But this sand blasting occurred a year ago in the city cemetery. I literally was there one morning and then I get a call later saying, did you see somebody sand blasting? And I said, no, because it happened after I left. This stone is beautifully white. I mean, like it hurts your eyes to look at it white. Great. But they did it through sand blasting, which has now caused pock marks in the stone, sandblasting then took out all the grass around it, and then, because that's what sandblasting does, and then also left a fine white powder, because sandblasting literally takes a layer off. So the more sandblasting that occurs, the more erosion on the stone. I'm not showing the front side, because the family actually had this done. If I had known this was going to happen, I would have suggested letting me clean it, and, um, and I, would, I would have done that. But the family had the right to do it. The Marietta City Cemetery plots are still technically owned by the families. The city just maintains the grounds, and then the families who are no longer around because they're all buried in the cemetery, or they're, um, they're, one, they're, th they're the only person there. Those are the stones um, we've been cleaning. But there have one, two, three. I know of at least four plots that have done sandblasting. But sandblasting also does not stop biological growth. It'll come, they'll find a way. So there's one plot where it was sandblasted mm, maybe five years ago, and the stones are starting to go black again. It, sand black, it, it's not going to prevent it. So let me show you, though, a stone similar size to ones you just saw with power washing and sandblasting. This is D2 on a stone. This is the front side before it was cleaned. That's the back side after it was cleaned. Do we feel like sandblasting and this or what? This is safe. Sandblasting is not. Do we feel like, does anybody feel like the quality is any less? No? I think it's, I think it looks pretty good. I mean, is, did it take a long time? Yes. Was it about a year? Maybe a little bit less. But if it had been sandblasted, especially on this one, if it had been sandblasted, that design work on the top, a whole layer of that's going to come off. It's going to be shallow. And we have a lot of stones uh, that have very very delicate detailing, especially along the tops, that one amount of sandblasting is going to take it all off. For example, there's some that have flowers or uh, wheat, and one amount of sandblasting is going to be gone. Sandblasting on that one that we saw, Austin Greens, probably would have destroyed that stone completely. So I want to show you right now my two favorite cleans that uh, have been done just at the Marietta City Cemetery. So this is the before, I'm gonna show you the before. This is February of last year. Uh, so we got this little stone. 
This is the after. Uh, the reason I love this one so much is because my son did this one. This is the one he picked. He was 10 at the time, he's 12 now, too cool to come out and clean with mom. But I have proof that he did some work outside. Um, so this is Eugene um, Haynes and he was six years old. We didn't even know when we were cleaning it. You could kind of see that it says six, but we, had, we didn't really have any idea. So that's two weeks ago, what it looks like. Okay, this one I did. I'm taking full credit for this one, everybody. This is the Starnes grave. This is a woodman of the world. So if you ever see ones that look like stumps or have a stump, Woodman of the World was an insurance company that men could buy insurance from and help cover the cost of their of funerals. It was a life insurance policy in essence. So this one um, is about my height, it's about 5'5", five five. rather deep. Uh, the log at the top is like bark. And this was last fall, and that was two weeks ago. Thank you, I'm proud of that one. Um, and that one, <laughs> that one truly has uh, done better than I expected. But um, what I wanted to say, uh, my coworker asked me yesterday, she goes, well, somebody's gonna ask you, like, how do you pick which stones? How do you, how do you pick which ones? Uh, so I would say a couple of things. First off, how in it do I want to be for the day? This stone was about an hour and a half of work. And there was one other stone next to it that I did that was flat, which was like 15 minutes. So how, how in it for the day am I feeling? Like I said, this morning I did five stones, three flat, one upright, one sort of flat in a about an hour and a half. So five stones in the same amount of time as that one. Um, sometimes it's really easy. Um, at Dawson Cemetery, the ones I picked first were, uh, there was a World War II soldier who had died November 1st, 1918. He was my, he was first. Couldn't even read it. I said veterans and children tend to be the ones I will go with first. Um, a lot of people go, well, you want to do one with a lot of detail like that, right? No, no. Those are hard. Those are a lot of work. Those are great when you really just want to focus on one. My other part that I, I think I like to choose is the ones where I think something is hidden and I'm going to find it, find a little secret to it. Um, so, for example, his, that whole um, medallion at the top, you couldn't really see the details of it until you started cleaning it. Um, so, I th sometimes I like to clean the ones that I think there's a secret. Um, this morning I had one that the secret was actually at the bottom of the base of the stone, and on the bottom it said, copyright by McNeil. Marble Company, Marietta, Georgia. So I didn't know it was there until I started cleaning it. But that's usually for me kind of, you gotta, you gotta know if, if you're gonna be in it for the day. Um, if you're really ready to take on a big task or you just wanna be able to knock out a few, four or five, and then go from there. So since I've showed you my favorites, what I'm gonna show you now are just Lovely pictures that I have taken. Different views of the cemetery in Marietta City. And then what I'm going to leave you with is you asking me questions. <laughs> so, because I'm sure there's a few. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you start at the top and work down, the bottom and work up? Excellent question. So, when I first started, um, I had seen people say you got to start from the bottom up because you don't want to cause streaking or anything. But actually, that's more of a method for buildings. Yeah. So for tombstones, you can work top down. I've done both. What you really want to do, and it's based more off of how you're scrubbing, circular motions. You don't want to be going up and down like this. 
You don't want to be making lines like the pressure washer was doing. So mix it up, do figure eights, do circles. You want to do that. That's really the key. Um, when it comes to applying the D2, you want to get it all over. You want it to get, as or get it orange. A little goes a long way, though. But when you're done scrubbing, you're going to rinse it off. It's OK to leave some of the D2 on. If the stone still looks a little orange, that's fine. It's going to lose that look as time goes on because this product is going to keep working. I know I sound like an advertisement for this, but if, the, if it's good enough for our national cemeteries and the park service, it's good enough for us. I'm not going to argue about this. And the white, yes, you're absolutely right. So we're not, I'm, it has become the new method because it's, it's something that all of us can use. Again, if you cannot do this method and you want something cheaper, again, the Orvis paste will work. It just doesn't work over time. So you might have to go back and do another application. So, yes ma'am. I know we're gonna have a lot of questions and that's fine. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. It's a liquid. So then one of the brushes that's on the table, or two of the brushes, whichever, yep. that's how long do you leave the product on? Okay, excellent question. Before you start scrubbing. Absolutely. So I will say this. If you buy D2, they do have the methods on here. So ideally five to ten minutes. So let's um okay. I'm gonna use one of my cemetery books as an example. I'm gonna spray it with water. I'm gonna get it really, really wet. I want to work with a wet stone. My bucket, my Easter bucket is gonna be full of water. My brushes are going to be wet. I'm going to apply a wet brush to a wet stone. No dry brush to wet stone, no dry brush to dry stone, except to brush some grass off very neat, nice and neat. Once my stone is wet and I feel like I've gotten the lichen off, Let's go ahead and get the D2. I'm going to spray it on. It's going to turn orange. I'm going to sit there for a couple minutes, but I'm going to watch that stone. If I start to see it getting dry, then you'll know it. You'll be able to see it. I'm going to apply a little bit, either a little bit more D2 or a little bit of water to keep the stone wet. And then I'm going to go back with my brush when I'm ready, start to brush in a circular motion, getting the D2 in, it will bubble, it will lather, it'll be amazing. But I'm going to keep that stone wet. I cannot emphasize this enough. The amount of water you think you need, you're going to need more. If you have access to a water source in your cemetery, great. If you don't, like I do not at Dawson, I average about eight gallons that I bring with me. Today I only used four but I always have a lot of water. But after we brush it, stone's wet, I'm happy with it. That's the other question I get. How do you know when to stop? How do you know when to stop scrubbing? Well, I think the first few times you do it, you keep going more, you keep brushing more because you keep thinking to yourself, it's not clean. It doesn't, it, it's still dark. Yes, it's dark because it's wet. When it dries, it will look much better. It's very, very hard. So I usually brush, do a rinse off. If I feel like there's a few spots left that could use a little bit more brushing, I'll do it. But the D2 is going to keep working after I'm done. That's why I don't rinse off all the D2. Then the stone will sit. It'll start drying. I'll go back later, and I'll take a picture. Uh, but that is for everybody, I think the really, the absolute hardest part is we want the stone to dry immediately. We want to see it clean. Probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to be dry by the time you're done with either another stone or by the time you leave. So you have to go back. Pa patience is key because a stone doesn't get dirty in a day. It's not going to get clean in a day. So does that make sense? Did I explain that well? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I actually buy it from a, pro a company called Atlas Preservation. I thought about it today, but I did not do it because um, 
well, one. My business cards are on the back table, and you could take one, and if you have specific questions, I'd like you to just email me. That way I can send you specific links versus trying to give you a whole sheet of just over stimulation and too much stuff, because what I'm saying right now in this past hour is a lot, absolutely a lot. So the company I use here is um, Atlas Preservation, um, and there are other ones. Is it available on Amazon? Yes. Is it expensive on Amazon? Yes. Do other places have it cheaper? Yes, shockingly. Um, so there is another product which I have used once, and I don't like it, and it's called Wet and Forget. Um, you can buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's. I don't think it, it does very well. It's great for your own sidewalks or whatever, but I, I personally don't think it works as well. Um, and I actually used it on a military headstone because the VA has approved it for that, but I didn't, it didn't give me anything better than what D2 has given, so. All right, yes, Russ. Yes. Does that mean that, that she has cleaned it and done the, the process that you've mentioned and then because you decided it needs another application, mm -hmm. you just spray the whole stone and leave it? Yes. And let mm -hmm. it just work over yep. several weeks. Not you, you spray it and just walk away from it. Yes, exactly. Uh, so that is again on the bottle. Another thing they mentioned is to go back six to nine months later take, um, just spray it on and walk away. Because again, a sc one scrub is kind of invasive for that stone. So we don't wanna necessarily go back less than a year later and scrub it some more. So just applying the D2 is kind of good to go in, get whatever's left and ready to go. And hopefully you'll get to that, like the first picture with the white marble, you'll get to that white marble, very bright look almost like what it w looked like when it was put in. So. Well, I know every stone I've cleaned, I've been so shocked when I've gone back. Mm -hmm. Even three, three weeks to a month or two months later, I, I dug up and I cannot believe the difference. It yep. looks better in the day I cleaned it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, a so, hundred percent. Sometimes you sit there and you think, oh, this isn't going to look good. Like, it's okay. This looks okay when you're done. But then, Three months later, six months later. Oh, look at it, it looks so pretty. So, also, that's probably the reason why I picked Charlotte Coquine's one right by the Sexton's house, because that's where I park every time. So, I have to see it every time. And there it is, glistening in the sunshine. So, yes, Mary. How do you find the owners and what is the plan? <sighs> okay, so for Dawson Cemetery, what I actually did was I went on the Cobb County Tax Assessor's website, found out who owned that land, found out it was a association. <laughs> I then pulled their tax records and found somebody to contact and I called her, she called me back. She said, oh, you need to talk to our president. I called him, we met one day I impressed him so much in 15 minutes that uh, he gave me money to purchase supplies to clean their cemetery. So they actually have a dedicated, their stuff is dedicated. It lives at my house. It does not get mixed in with any of the city stuff. Uh, so that's how I did it. If you cannot find someone, that's when I would, again, like I said, I went through the tax offices first. Um, that is, to be honest, the, the easiest way to do it. But again, if it's your family, you can. You can clean their stones. Um, but the other part is, um, if it's again, if it's on private property, you do have to ask permission. Even it, there's many cemeteries around here where you can just walk in, and that's great. You can go and visit. Doesn't mean you can go clean. You can just go and visit the people but you can't go and clean their stones. You still have to ask permission. Uh, and Cobb County does also have a Cobb County Cemetery Preservation Commission. Um, and they're a group that meets, I think, once a month. 
um, and they have an email. And if, you, if you're unsure of a cemetery, they might be able to help as well. All right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. They are orange at the bottom because of damage from her hurricane. Mm-hmm. Damaged a lot of yep. Stone. Do you just leave that there? That's the damage from the, the dirt. That's the iron oxide yeah. staining so in. I don't even. D two won't work on it because it's not a biologic. It's the it's the iron oxide in the in the dirt. I know. Darn Georgia clay. Yeah. Not the, the, Not the National Cemetery. National the VA, yeah. They were professionally done. Yep. They were okay on the, the tombs because they were professionally done. It wasn't done with two foot gloves or something like that. I'm hoping whatever, whoever they use, they use something that is akin to this. Because there are a couple of others that have been approved, but I have not used them, so I'm not going to specifically promote or, or advocate for those. There are a couple of, of methods from a few years ago that it included a gentle, gentle-ish acid that was all right, but they're really pushing away from that now. Okay. But we can, I mean, we can talk later. You, I know where you are and you know where I'm at, so. <laughs> all right, do I have other questions? Yes, sir. It's not as, well, yes, yes and no, because a lot of the biological growth, such as lichen, moss, that's invasive. Um, so when I, let's go back to one. Uh, my aunt, my aunt goes, but I, I like it that they look like that. They look, you know, mysterious. Yeah, they totally do look mysterious. I agree with you. But lichen and and, and all that is invasive. It is cracking into that stone. It is going in and causing cracks that is potentially going to break it from the inside out. So if you see a stone that's heavily covered in moss and lichen, I highly recommend, if you can, if you have permission or it's your family, I highly recommend cleaning it because it is going to help it last longer. Now, there are some elements to it, though, that we just can't help. Uh, one is temperature, if we have really fluctuating temperatures, uh, if there are other things that, again, maybe rodents or gophers that like to go under and pop, like I'm not, I can't help the gophers. Um, but, but we can definitely, this stone obviously is gonna have an extended life. It doesn't necessarily mean though that something else isn't gonna cause damage to it or just people. People cause damage. Some people like to just go and push them over. Jerks. But, but yeah, so it does extend the life, but it's not necessarily going to, um, that's not the only factor. Cleaning is, is only one part. Yes, ma'am. No. Nope. Because, again, your family paid for that. So your family... You are the people that get to take care of it. I tried to convince my cousins to clean, but they said, no, we just clip the grass around it. If you want to come and clean it, that's all you. I'm like, you live 12 hours away. Just spray it on and go walk away. No. But, all right, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So for us, if you want to clean at the Marietta City Cemetery, you would have to let me know or somebody else know, who I'm not going to call out, who might be hiding in the back, um, <laughs> that you want to clean. But we do not provide the supplies. You would have to let us know what stones. We would have to go out and check to make sure that they're stable enough to clean. And again, if you want to do a cemetery, you would have to reach out to whoever owns that cemetery, like I did with Dawson. Um, that's really the, the only options you have. Uh, now, if you had somebody who you knew, and for example, you had a friend who lived six hours away, but you knew their grandparents were buried here, you could always ask them and say, do I have your permission to clean your grandparents' headstones? And they, if they said yes, then you can. 
You just have to get permission from the owners, the family, like that. Now, I will be having, uh, before I forget, two workshop, two cleaning workshops in October and two walking tours probably in November. The cleaning workshops are limited to 10 people only. The walking tours go up to 20 or 25. If you've never done a walking tour with me, um, they're a hoot. I have a lot of fun. Um, November, <laughs> I don't know yet. Maybe one on the 4th and one on the 11th. Or not the, the 12th, I don't know yet. Oh, I know Tina, we can go out anytime you want. You know, but um, most of my walking tours are themed. Um, we've done, and this is how I've died, versions one, two, and volume one, two, and three. Um, we've done, Death by Transportation was the last one. That was a pretty good one. Um, I've done Mothers in, of Marriott. I've done Pioneers, African Americans, um, business owners, medical people, veterans. Always got a new story. Always got a good one. Um, I've got a very special story that I do on every tour. So if you ever want to hear it, you'll have to just come on that tour. Um, but do I have any last questions? If not, and you feel more comfortable talking to me individually, that's perfectly fine. If you feel more comfortable emailing me, my business cards are on the back. My very rare limited edition Marietta Museum of History business cards, which we are no longer called, with free passes to the museum on the back. So get them while they're there, because they're going to be gone. Um, so yes, ma'am, you have one more question? Um, where will we find the tapes? Yes. They will be on our website, which is marietahistory.org, on our Facebook page as well. The workshops normally are in the morning. Uh, the walking tours tend to be in the morning as well. The workshops are usually about two hours. The walking tours are an hour to an hour 15-ish. Um, and we will have all that information, hopefully this week, on our website. And then tickets can be purchased through our online store. OK? Um, but yes, feel free to come up and look and touch. Uh, the books I have here are Volume 1, Cobb County Cemeteries, Volume 2, Volume 3 is the National Cemetery, True Meanings, Symbolisms in Cemeteries, The Grave Intentions, a Georgia one, a Graveyard Preservation Primer, um, and then actually I do have one question for all of you um, as I was you know, getting ready for today, and I was going to, and I've done it out at the cemetery, but if, if anybody's interested, would anybody be interested in a lecture like this on symbolism? Yep, Symbol in the, symbolism in the cemeteries, okie dokie. I will talk to the boss about that. So, I wanna thank you guys so much. Feel free to come and see all this great stuff. Feel free to look at the map. Feel free to grab business cards. Feel free to talk to me. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves. So thank you.